Hey guys, how are you? Um, thanks for joining the class today. My name is Melissa Batafarano. Um, let me just close this over here. I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you guys can all see that. I'm pretty sure you can. Um, so again, thanks so much for joining today. I'm really excited that everybody's here. So, um, I am, I just want to give you guys a little bit of background on myself for everybody who's not familiar. Um, again, my name is Melissa Batafarano. I have been a in the fashion industry for about 20 years. Um, I started my career um, yeah, in the late 90s. I went to FIT studied fashion design. Um, I studied knitwear design. Then when I was in school, I worked at Tommy Hilfiger. So I worked at Tommy Hilfiger pretty much all four years and then stayed on after school. Um, I worked in men's sweater design. So I started my career really in men's. Um, and then from there, I moved to, um, they, at that point, they called it kind of the urban market. Now you'd call it more streetwear. Um, I worked with Mark Echo. Uh, he had Echo Unlimited. I'm sure you guys remember that. It was the, the brand with the Rhino. Um, and that was really, really an amazing time to work for that brand. Again, that was in the early 2000s. Um, and that a ton of those brands were really popping off at that time. There was Sean John, there was Echo, there was Fat Farm, there was FUBU. Um, and those brands were really making noise. Um, it was a great community to be a part of. So I was happy to start my career in that way. Um, I went from Mark Echo over to Sean John. So um, I was a men's senior designer there. And that was such a great time to be at Sean John. I, we won the CFDA award when we were there, um, which was the first time um, an African-American had ever, ever won the CFDA award. So you can imagine how much we celebrated. Um, and it was just a really wonderful time again to be, to be a part of something that was really changing history. Um, unfortunately at that time in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, I would say that kind of market was taking a bit of a downturn so, you know, throughout one's career, you really have to kind of take a step back and assess what's really happening in the landscape um, of, you know, of design and of brands and what's uptrending, what's downtrending. So again, I saw the writing on the wall that that market was really downtrending. So I pivoted my, pivoted my career and made a little bit of a left turn into the active world. I moved up to Boston and I worked at Puma. Um, I worked at Puma for a couple of years. I did men's and women's design. Um, we had started golf and tennis at that point. And then after that, I moved back down to New York. I worked at Champion and I headed up the C9 business. So C9 was a Champion business that sold in Target. Um, and it was the top number one business in all of Target. In fact, um, more so than just active, it was the, the number one selling um, soft lines apparel brand in all of Target. Um, and that was really the first time full on I had done women's. Um, from there, I went to Ralph Lauren and I just remember how excited I was to get that job at Ralph Lauren. It was the first time I had had a director title. I went back to um, sportswear. So it was men's, the director of men's knits and sweaters. And I just remember at that point in my career, I was like, wow, I made it. I made it. This was like the pinnacle. I was never going to leave. I had wanted to work at Ralph so, so badly. Um, and yeah, I was like beating my head into the wall to get that job and finally got the job. And, you know, is, that was just the beginning of my career. I mean, again, I thought that that was the be all and end all, a wonderful place to be, but it wasn't all I, I made it such a thing in my head. And, you know, it really, it, it was really remarkable, but again, just, just the tip of the iceberg of my career. Um, after Ralph Lauren, I wound up going back into active. I worked at Fila for about three and a half years, um, starting a golf business there. So we did, I did men's and I did golf. Um, and then after that, I really wanted to, to jump into women's. I had dabbled in women's design, but never really, with the exception of Champion, I had never really worked full on um, doing just women's. So I worked really, really hard. I, I changed my entire portfolio, my entire book, my entire look. Um, and I got hired by Tori Birch. She was launching a sportswear line called Tori Sport. Um, yeah, and I, and I helped her launch that line. Again, it was a great time to be at that brand, working with her. She's such a powerhouse and such a revolutionary woman. And um, she's a private company, so she doesn't really have to take input from other people. So it was really remarkable to, to work directly for the woman whose name is on the label. Um, and just to really work for a strong, powerful woman like that who has her own eccentricities and 
her own storied career. So I, I really, really enjoyed that. And I wouldn't have left um, with the exception of that I got called by Rihanna. So I, it was at the time she was just named creative director at Puma and my old bosses were still at Puma and, you know, gave me a call. They knew, um, my old boss knew that I had worked with Celebrity, I'd worked with Puff, I had done a couple little um, consultancy projects with Fab. So I, you know, kind of worked worked with Celebrity, worked with big personalities, again, working with Tori. So he had, they had arranged a meeting for me to meet with Rihanna. I met with her around Christmas time of that year. I was hired by the beginning of 2015 and I went on to work with her for five years. I um, was responsible for creating the IP, um, everything from the internal marketing to um, selecting fabrics, helping to select the factory allocation, all the hand sketching, the fit, um, really working hand in hand with Rihanna to, um, yeah, to really, to really craft what Fenty X Puma was going to be. So we did four shows, two in New York, two in Paris. Um, and then after that contract was finished, she was launching a lingerie line, which I'm sure you, you guys have heard of called Savage X Fenty. And at the time it was just in its infancy. Um, she moved me over to work with Savage. And that again was, was really a new turning point for me. I had never done lingerie. We had never done extended sizes. And that was really, you know, all Rihanna and all what she wanted to do. She didn't want to be another Me Too brand. She didn't want to be like a Victoria's Secret. She wanted to do something different and something that only really she could do, which was, you know, really offering um, size ranges to a, a multitude of, of different girls, which, you know, women, women and people that were really unseen prior to the market, um, prior to her, you know, launching on the market. So again, it was a huge learning curve for me. Um, but yeah, it was, it was extremely rewarding. One of the most rewarding things I think I've done in my career. Um, did three shows for her, um, two of which were done with Amazon. Again, it was the first time a fashion brand had ever done a simulcast with Amazon. Um, yeah, after five years, it was time for me to try something else. I moved on to Calvin Klein. I was a VP of design at Calvin Klein, headed up collabs. And then that takes me to my current position now. I am currently creative director at Diesel, working under Glenn Martins. Um, I headed up a head up a Diesel Sport which is a new sport initiative, um, athleisure initiative that Diesel has decided to do under um, their new management. They've never done an active wear line before um, and we launched last season. So it's been really exciting and really rewarding to work with Glenn. He is a tremendous talent. I'm learning a ton from him and really excited to be a part of that, that new brand launch. Essentially, it's you know relaunching the brand. Um, additionally, I'm working with Wolford, um, doing a collab for them, um, a sustainable zero waste collab. Um, for a new product category that they have not yet done. Um, it's going to be launching next year, and that is really tailored for the U.S. So that's a little bit about me. Um, also, I launched my own brand last year called Tony 1923. Stands for Top of New York. Um, also, my father's name was Tony, and he was born in 1923. So it's kind of a love letter to my father and a love letter to New York. So I just wanted to show you a couple of slides from our show last year. We had a Four Leanies which was pretty major, it was a restaurant down here, downtown Chinatown, um, which unfortunately closed um, earlier this year, you know, due to the pandemic, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, this picture from Vogue, I just wanted to show you one of my lookbooks, which we had shot at Rayo's, which is the restaurant, Italian restaurant uptown, it was the first time they had ever done um, a shoot there. So just to show you a quick little snippet of that. So that's a little bit about me. And then I'm going to go into the um, the class that we're taking today. So I wanted to talk about um, how you really start a collection. So what this comprises is um, kind of the building blocks and the starting foundation point of launching the Diesel Sport collection that is currently out now. So this is the mood board, the initial workings of a mood board. So for the, again, for the spring, summer, fall, winter 22 collection. Um, so, you know, initially working with Glenn, Glenn Martins um, 
His own collection is called Y Project, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it is extremely avant-garde. Um, it has nothing to do with sport. Um, it is a fashion, high fashion collection edition. He was the second designer named to do the Gautier um, collab after Jean-Paul Gautier has retired. Um, so again, that was couture. So he did that last couture week. Um, he's a, a, a tremendous talent, but at his own admission has never worked out, does not work out, does not go to a gym, um, is not really overly interested in active product. Um, but obviously this collection had to absorb and understand the DNA and where Glenn was going with the ready to wear collection and the denim collection. Um, additionally, this was started during the pandemic. So I had, you know, Glenn, they're working in between Paris and Milan and I'm here in New York. So it was really trying to understand what he was trying to do, share a lot of imagery back and forth. And this is with any collection, any way you start, this is, this is pretty much the building blocks of, of how you would start for, you know, a new launch or a brand that is um, relaunching, going back into their archives and, and relaunching, um, you know, Diesel has been around for 40 years. So Glenn really wanted to kind of get back to the heyday and the spirit um, and the original brand DNA. So he was really digging in the archives. They have a tremendous archives. So they shared a lot of that with me. So what you'll see here, and again, is this is very typical. So I don't care what brand you're working. It's Ralph, it's Calvin, whatever it is, you're gonna go in the archives um, and see where the brand has been. You have to do your homework and you have to do your research. So this is just um, a little bit of a smattering of the initial, um, research building blocks to do the collection. So they had dug in the crates of a lot of these original mood boards. So you can see these were, you know, definitely from the late nineties, a lot of this color blocking, large logoing, um, the motocross inspiration, a lot of this, you know, kind of varsity jacket turning into a vest, um, some of the denim workwear inspirations. We had poured through old lookbooks. And like I said, the company's been around for 40 years. There was a ton of stuff to pour through. And it's really extrapolating what Glenn was focusing on and then what I could jump onto because it's it all needs to come from one handwriting. It's the brand Diesel. It's not Glenn's line. It's not Melissa's line. It's Diesel. And it has to all look like it's come from the same hand. Doesn't matter how many designers are working on it. Um, so you can see here as well, going back into the archive and really pulling a selection of some of the um, the little matchbooks that were on the back of the denim um, labels, a lot of the little hits, the little shank buttons, you know, kind of just the labeling, the main labeling to kind of see what logos, what fonts we want to use, any of the verbiage, any of the graphic hits, the layup. So there was a, a ton to go through. Um, and then again, this is just a smattering of, it kind of starts as a big funnel and then you kind of narrow it down. Um, he had also sent me a lot of old Polaroids and a lot of photographs of, of archival pieces that they had pulled that they want to take inspiration from. Um, and then again, a lot of his initial development. So when I finally was able to go to Italy, this was a rail that he was working on for the ready, ready to wear collection. Again, I'm not supposed to do the exact same stuff that he's doing, but what washes are you looking at? What's the color palette that you're looking at? You can see the sweatshirt here. It had, you know, a lot of the bleaching and washing and you know, kind of PP spray and stuff like that. How can I interpret that for active wear, which obviously has to be a print and you can't do the same washes and abrasion that you can do on cotton products, on synthetic product you do for active wear. Um, and then again, he sent me so many tear sheets, a ton of stuff from Instagram. Um, we were really into old Zuli bet. So it's just, again, like funneling this down, making sense of the references that he's pulling from, and then how can I extrapolate that and now make, make a collection out of it. So now this is the mood boards that we finally landed on. So this is um, a combination of my tear sheets, Glenn's tear sheets, you know, his head of design also on the ready to wear collection and really just, you know, in my graphic designer. So you can see some of the labels that we selected here, which is, this is an old diesel label. It said like with love, I can't even read it with love and ton Italian glamour. I mean, the stuff is really crazy. The stuff that they used to do, which is super fun. So this is from some of the old lookbooks, this beautiful shape here um, that we wound up using for a neckline shape for a bra. So it's a lot of vintage references. This, what you'll get from the first page of this mood board is again, mood, it's color, it's silhouette, it's vibe. So you can see we were definitely going for a strong 90s, early 2000s reference. Um, the tear sheet up here is a Gautier. Obviously Glenn was working on Gautier at the same time. So he was definitely digging in the crates of, of what Gautier was doing, which would be very applicable to do, to do in sports. So you can see that reference there. Again, the old Zuli bet, um, a lot of old polo jeans, polo sport, 
definitely took, um, took inspiration and you'll see all of this then trickled throughout the line. So when we build mood boards, I personally like to do a ton of imagery. Now, if I'm working for Calvin Klein, you'll see like four or five images on a white background and that's it. Calvin Klein is a brand that's extremely clean, clean aesthetic. So again, you have to know the brand that you're working for. A brand like Diesel is kind of more is more. Um, and Glenn likes to see a ton of references. So I wanted to make sure, and again, at this point we were working remotely. So I wanted to make sure he really understood what I was going for and could see really in the imagery that we had pulled. Again, a lot of this, you know, we did a lot of racer back detail here with the contrast cover lock stitching, more vintage diesel, more vintage diesel lockups, um, a lot of traditional sport references, more Zuli bet. So you can really see, you know, kind of where we're going here with the mood. And then I always like to, you know, really have graphic inspiration and then silhouette inspiration. So for graphic inspiration, again, a ton of vintage diesel. We definitely, it's, diesel's a mass market brand. It's leans luxury, but it's a mass market brand. You're going to need to have a logo print. So we dug a lot in the archives to find um, a lot of um, references for logos and how we could kind of update an all over logo print. Um, again, the Monaco image here is just, we love the old soccer jersey and we wound up doing a lot of this for jackards the old diesel taping here. Um, again, this is all for graphic. Glenn loved the Rasta collection from Galliano Dior. Um, again, playing with the taping and the all over print. So you can kind of see how a lot of these references wound up going into the collection. Um, this vintage soccer jersey here, again, playing with the idea. We You'll see how I updated it, doing this as a logo, but really having a reference. So there's it's it's really your blueprint that you're going back to. Um, again and again when you're doing the collection. And then I always like to have a details page. So to me, it's again, you shouldn't really be guessing when you're starting to design a line and you're not designing in a vacuum. You're not gonna sit there with your pencil and a piece of paper and just like, well, gee, what do I design now? The, the boards that you make are for a reason. They're, it's, it's again, it's a blueprint. The merchant signs off on it, your, your boss signs off on it, the owner of the company, whoever it is, you're, team has to sign off and it's everybody's coming back to this as a bible so you know we're looking for details we love the dolphin here we love the little side zipper we love a cross zipper detail we love the back hits the surplus vintage diesel piece we wanted to do a bodysuit we love the cutouts here like you know again it's all it's all here so you shouldn't be guessing when you're trying to design because it's all like okay we definitely wanted to do articulation we wanted to do zip off sleeves we love the applied on zippers it's it's the details that you you have in your reference that again, you're, you're going back to time and time again. Again, these were, you know, again, like I said, it's like a funnel. So the initial references that the research time that you're, that you're doing, you're going to drill it down. And what are you really going to narrow in on? So we loved this kind of gradation stripe um, fill. So we took inspiration from this for sure. We loved this kind of round and really clean diesel hit. Um, we wound up using this kind of layup for some verbiage. Um, we were kind of, we were also doing the main label. So we wanted to see shapes that we wanted to do. We really like this for an internal neck label. Um, what D shape are we going to use? Again, what logo can we use? Like, you'll know the big D that you kind of seeing everywhere now. He didn't, Glenn did not want that used in the sport line. So we had to find a logo that we were going to use, um, and kind of really run with it's, it's diesel. It's a logo brand. So, you know, again, that's, that's where a lot of this, um, study helped. And then going into color. So the second part of this is really talking about color palette. So again, it's it shouldn't be, I'm just looking through the Pantone book and pulling a bunch of chips. It's really a blueprint. When you do color, it's methodical. Um, again, this is, I'm, I lean more towards obviously active and athleisure. If this was for Ralph Bottoms, you would see a, a variety of shades of khaki. You would see a variety of shades of navy, some blacks and grays a lot more variety of color. When you do sport, you generally are doing colorways that have one, two to three colors in it. Um, so again, it's very easy that you're doing, you're, you break it off into primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. This is how I learned how to do color like 15 years ago, still break color down this way. It's the easiest to explain to people. And the easiest, again, it's a blueprint. You're going back to it. These are my colorways. You know, it's like, it's uh, going to be red and then it's going to be hit with white. It's going to be black. It's going to be with cherry tomato and then empire yellow, whatever it happens to be. Your primary core colors, that's the biggest main body color. 
Then you have your secondary colors, which would be your color block. Again, the secondary use of color. And then you might have an accent color, which is your third color hit. So everything needs to coordinate. Um, so your bra is going to match your leggings, going to match your jacket, particularly in active. It's it's quite like granimals and matchy matchy. Um, makes it easier for the customer to make multiple purchases, easy for the merchants to make their buys because the, the store and the website is cohesive. Um, so again, you're not just plucking colors just because you like them. It's, you know, it's, it's all quite methodical. And then you can see again, the final color palette. So obviously when you're presenting color, you don't have to necessarily break it down primary, secondary, tertiary, you can show a full color flow. And then the tear sheets that I pulled from the mood board to really hit home where I'm getting this from. So we really focused on primaries, um, saturated pastels, and then of course you have the Heather and then your four colors, your black and white and grays. And then I wanted to kind of show you the collection. Again, um, you'll see some of these, some of these pieces are already out for spring, summer. Um, and then you'll really see um, most, the rest of these come out over fall holiday. Some of them wound up getting dropped like this. Unfortunately, this dress wound up getting dropped, but you can really see, I think, um, from where the initial research started all the way to, you know, color theory. So for example, this track suit, you can see where we got it from this vintage Madonna tear. It's not always like, oh, you knocked it off. Okay. But it's a lot of, when you design, it's a lot of curation. It's a lot of where are you getting the references from? Again, you wanna have a blueprint, you wanna have a Bible. Um, and a lot of times you're presenting to merchants and you're presenting to people that are not designers and oftentimes they need a proof of concept. Um, but again, the way I did it, this is in a super, super light um, parachute fabric. It was lined in mesh and the details, and then you have the little diesel patch on left chest. We have the tear out hood, um, the rib on the inside neck, the little locker loop in the back playing around with the color. So you can really see, you know, it winds up being a really modern um, and forward piece. We have the stretch mesh dress. We have the little um, cropped hoodie with the little slit. This is a two by two rib, um, the thumb holes with a cute little t-shirt down here. So you can really see how it was applied um, from the mood all the way through to the collection. So this was the logo print that I was talking about. We wound up doing it tone on tone as a saray print. This, we wound up doing that jacquard. So you saw the Monica tear sheet that was a jacquarded knit um, you can see here, we did it in a little bomber jacket and a little track pant, that tone on tone jacquard, um, shiny satin jacquard. Um, of course, it's a denim brand. So we were really trying to do a study on how we were going to incorporate the idea of denim into an active work collection. This was scans of vintage denim. Again, it came from the vintage denim that, de that Glenn was looking at from the archives. So my graphic designer scanned in a bunch of the pieces that Glenn was really referencing, which was the really um, heritage original models of, of diesel from the 90s. And we scanned them in and made this kind of all over toss print. And then I did this little Jackron label that worked for sport. So again, it looks like a little, you know, Jackron Levi's patch, but it wound up being a heat transfer. So it really worked for active wear, um, not itchy. It's, you know, stretches with stretch fabrics. And then again, you'll see the logo print here again, and then blocked with the logo taping. So again, that came from that Dior reference. So everything kind of goes back to what the reference was. Um, this was really taken, the idea of the chopped off branding here was taken from that Polo Sport reference. So everything, everything has a reason for being. This was kind of inspired by the Zuli bet, but again, this is done in a nylon warp knit jersey with a little rubber patch, a little rubber patch on the back, ultra high-waisted legging, ultra high-waisted bike short, um, the little scuba jacket. Again, it's, it's all, it's all from the references the little short with the zipper, but I did it in a crinkle woven that was done, you know, in a little Jersey or something. So it's in a crinkle woven, had a short underneath. So it now becomes a running short. And then we have the men's, you know, very easy here with the logo tape. This was really inspired from one of the vintage pieces that we found. The tone on tone jacquard again, the soccer jacquard, um, the color blocked, um, uh, jersey here, the hockey jersey here. Again, we did it a logo initiative, and then you can see the vintage D logo that I showed you. That's you know how we wound up using the logo, and then we have one of the little vintage tags that we found from the archives of Diesel, updating that for today and putting that in as a jock tag. And then again, this came kind of from that vintage soccer top that I showed you, the vintage D logo from the archives. That was how we updated here. Tearaway um, trico pant. 
Um, again, very, very reminiscent of pieces that you saw with the double hit here, very soccer, vintage soccer inspired. This, I just put this here really to hammer the idea home. This is that satin tone on tone um, soccer jersey with using the logo taping the pops so super, super true to, to soccer here. Again, a few more men's pieces. And yeah, then, you know, fully seam sealed bonded jacket, just updating that logo print again, putting the ombre behind it, making it a little bit more modern. And then, you know, again, a really, really clean piece here that was inspired from vintage polo sport. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of it, you guys. Um, let me see if, um, yeah. Kyle from Creatively chiming in here. A lot of people are wondering and asking, where do you find your references and where do you go for inspiration? Sorry, here's my dog, by the way. Hey. <laughs> 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 Get down. Sorry. Moment. <laughs> yeah. Where are you on your inspiration? Where where are you going for this inspiration? <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, a lot of them, like, so let me go back up to the mood board. It's again, a lot of those came from Glenn, from those so vintage references from the archives. So, like, you know, like a lot, all of these labels and stuff is really from the diesel archives. This is from diesel lookbook. So a lot of it is actually from vintage diesel. Um, I have a ton of books. I have a ton of scanned magazines. I, when during COVID at this time, the FIT library was closed. The FIT library is a wonderful um, research tool that they have lookbooks and lookbooks and lookbooks dating back from the seventies of every brand you could imagine. They have every um Victoria's Secret catalog they have old Prada lookbooks they have um every um collections book so you can just sit there and look at all the old collections I mean so that to me I have I have so many scans just from the years of going there that I always kind of look to and I you know when you when you're designing you have things that you love and things that you go back to so you have to keep archives so I have archives in folders of um, scans and photos of books and stuff that I've taken. I have a ton of personal books um, that I go back to. I have a ton of library books. I look on, obviously I look on the internet and I think, you know, in terms of Instagram, I do think Instagram is a great tool, but I think it's, um, it's not enough. And if you're just looking at a show that's on, you know, oh, I saw some Instagram, let me just snap it. So for example, like Glenn sent me this, you know, like, Okay, it's Helena Christensen. I think it's Aritzia. I can't, uh, not Aritzia, um, Kretzia. But it's like, you know, I want to go back and look at the show. I'm not just going to take a tear sheet and be like, oh, all right, yeah, it's from Instagram. Cool, let me do it. Like, no, what is this? What collection was this from, from Gautier? What year was it from? I'm going to go back and look at the whole show. So you have to really do your due diligence. Otherwise, you just become like a copycat, me too, and you don't even know where anything's from. Um, so I think it's really important to, to really do the due diligence and do the research and not at all just look at the internet. You have to look at books and magazines and, and you have to keep your own archives because you go back to stuff time and time again. Thanks for answering that. And also another question that's coming in pretty often is about your illustrations. A lot of compliments, but also people are wondering what you use to design your illustrations. And also- yeah. And one um, particular question is, have you heard of Tech Packer? Of what? I guess that's a no. Tech Packer. <laughs> I, I mean, I know what a Tech Pack is. So so there, it, it, is it says, I've heard of Tech Packer to see if it would be great to be benefit me. I'm wondering if this is a particular software or something. I'm not sure. I don't know what that is. I use Illustrator. All right. So I do my sketches initially by hand. Um, and then I have a designer who now does my, <laughs> who does my, <laughs> my CADs in Illustrator because I don't enjoy doing sketches by an Illustrator anymore, but we use Illustrator. Um, yeah, that, that's the, the industry standard. Okay, and a few more questions coming in. Um, what's something that you wish someone else had told you before starting your career in fashion and something you wish you had known beforehand? Something I wish that somebody would have told me. I think people told me and warned me not to go into fashion. So I think I already had a healthy dose of this is going to be hard. Um, like I was already told to have a thick skin. I was already told 
this is probably not the career you should go into. Um, just in terms of like, if you, as a creative, it's it's really putting, it's putting yourself out there, right? But it's not, you know, it's it, your name is not on the label when you're, you know, I'm like a hired hand, truly. Unless that's why I, sh I started off showing my own collection. Like that's when it's my collection, I can say what I want to do, when I want to do it, what I want to do, what colors I want to change it to. When you're working for a brand, it's you, you're coming up with designs and coming up with creativity, but it's, you know, you're presenting to somebody else. It's somebody else's name on the door, not yours. So you have to fall in line with their aesthetic. So you have to really understand that, um, yeah, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about, it's about the brand. Um, and it's about money and it's about, you know, it, you want to keep your job. You want to be happy. You want to be pleasant. You want, you know, it's, it's, it's all that. So something that I wish somebody would told me, I think, like I said, I think I already knew it was, it was a tough field to go into. Um, I was prepared that way. Um, I think, I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, and I think that's how I would answer that question. Awesome. <laughs> And also leading from that, here's another good question that kind of deals with that same and a uh, same vein. Um, do you select the pieces that are part of the collection, or is it a given? Like the like we need two sports bra designs, one swimsuit design, four track suits, et cetera. Um, well, there's a line plan. So you get a line plan from the merchant. So they tell you how much each piece needs to cost, how many track jackets you need, how many, you know. And because this was the first foray for Diesel to do active, obviously I'd done it several times in my career. So I was guiding them the pieces that I think that they needed to have in the collection. Um, and there's also like, for example, like this dress was obviously not in the line plan, but I thought it was important for a brand like Diesel, which again, it's not like Nike, you know, it's a fashion brand. So you're able to do fun pieces like that, that like a Nike couldn't do. So, you know, pieces that I wanted to get in, you obviously, you know, you give your input. Um, but yeah, so it's like, they'll tell, oh, I need three track suits, whatever. So generally you design, you know, five or six, and then it's between me and Glenn and, you know, which ones does he like? Oh, I think, you know, for example, like I was initially doing a lot with this of like angled piecing and he really wanted everything very straight and like horizontal. He didn't really love, like this was the only one that kind of made it in, but anything else, he just wanted very straight and clean blocking. So you know, it's a, de it's a design conversation between you and that of creative or whatnot. And then in terms of the amount of SKUs and styles, it's, you know, it's a business. So it has to go back to the line plan. All right. And with that, the, another question that leans in that same vein is how do you balance your creative vision with the need to sell to merchants? Oh, well, it's all a conversation. I mean, so it's, you know, again, it's like, I'm presenting what I it's what I think is uh, suitable for the tracks. Like, yeah, like I said, you need three tracksuits. Okay, I think this you definitely need to have one that looks like that. You know, you're you're convincing and cajoling people. Um, you know, they need something with a logo. Like, okay, cool, let's do something subtle and understated like this. So, it's it's constantly it's it's you have to be very good at convincing to try to get what the pieces that you think are right for the brand in there. So it's no. Well, cool. thank you for answering that for them. Um, another question that's come in says, how hard would you say it is to tap into the fashion industry? Is it possible to work with bigger brands or just get out there without having to live in the big city? I, uh, I think you have to, I think going to school is very important. Um, I think a lot of people don't think school is important these days. I think going to a fashion school is the most important step up you can have to get into fashion industry. Um, I don't, I think that schools are back in session going to campus and stuff now. So like, you know, there's a great school, there's SCAD that's in the South, in North Carolina, South Carolina. So that's not like a real big fashion city, but it happens to be a fantastic school. So if you go to a school like that, I mean, they have connections with brands that are in the fashion industry. And oftentimes there's internship programs. So you know, it's not really a big mystery. It's like getting into anything else. Like, say you want to go into finance. Like, you can't just walk into Bear Stearns and be like, "I'm going to be a banker now." Like, you have to study it. You have to. You have to have the tools to to do the job. It's really like anything else. You know, you get an internship. You make connections. It's it's really just like any other industry. It, it's not. There's definitely nuances, obviously. Um, 
And I just, I think that, I think that's in any industry, you have to make connections, you have to put yourself out there, you have to, you know, if you work in an office, I know now with COVID and people wanting to work from home, I think, to me, I think it's kind of like a, a problem, like, a, it is, a, it is a problem. I was just saying it to somebody yesterday. It's like, I think I've made some of the best friends that I've made working in an office and working on design teams. And that's how you get jobs later in your career. Initially, it's through school and internships. But after that, it's the connections that you make nine times out of 10. I mean, I can count literally on one finger the amount of jobs I've gotten through recruiters. Oftentimes, it's through people you know, and that's through work. And that's not through like sitting in your apartment and wearing sweats and not wanting to go into an office. You have to put yourself out there. It's, you know, you're a creative entity, you're a creative being. And, you know, that's, it's kind of your greatest asset, meeting people, being friendly, um, all of that. All of that is how you break into the fashion industry and really how you break into any industry. I think it applies to a bevy of different industries. A lot of people asking if you feel that fashion school is necessary and it's safe to say yes. Yes. I think there's certain skills that you need. You need to know how to sew. You need to know how to make a pattern. You need to know the building blocks in order to not do the building blocks. Like you need to, you need to know how to sketch. You need to know how to convey your ideas. You need to know knit from woven. You need to know what a chiffon, how a chiffon drapes versus how a jersey drapes. You need like, absolutely. And then from there, then you can kind of do what you want to do, but it's a skill. It's, you know, you need, absolutely. You need to know how, how, for example, I was in a fitting a couple of weeks ago and we wound up doing this like asymmetric jacket. And then Glenn wanted to put piping adjacent to the zipper and we had a, a taping over it. I had to sit with the pattern maker and figure out how we were going to insert the piping with the zipper being exposed. And it was a waterproof zipper. And it's like, okay, well, we don't want the stitch here. You have to know how to put a zipper in. How do you, how are you going to learn that unless you have somebody teach you how to put a zipper in a, into a garment? I, so I, I guess I think school is very important. And interestingly, from there is a question that says, I have a degree in fashion design and have made clothing over the years, but I haven't had experience in the industry. What would you recommend to a person trying to break in and secure a design job? So why is so you've never had, the person has never had an internship. They just are out like a home, a home. They don't necessarily mention if they had an internship or not, but they do have a degree in fashion design. So I guess they didn't directly, I mean, she can add, go add more to the Q&A if she would like, I'll take a look at it. But yeah, it seems like she has a degree in fashion design and has made things, but hasn't actually worked with a company. I, I mean, I would suggest getting an internship. Because you have to really know the like getting a job in the fashion world, like it's unless you're going to work like in an atelier for like Oscar or something as a pattern maker. Oftentimes you're doing tech packs. That's your first job, you know, which, you know, you have to know how to cat, you know, sketch one of these cads. You have to know how to do the tech pack. You have to know, you know, OK, we're going to make the zipper opening five inches. You know, you're doing you're doing the tech pack. So that's that's nine times out of ten how you're going to start in at fashion. So um yeah, I'd recommend getting, trying to get an internship. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question is, did you have faith in your work early in your career or did you say that came over time? Where does your confidence stem from? Um, I think sometimes you have to fake your confidence. Um, I mean, always be prepared. Don't like go in not prepared, but I think sometimes you gotta, you know, fake the funk a little bit, <laughs> like, um, and you kind of just go in and you're like, right. Cause obviously if, if you don't believe in what you're talking about, nobody else is. So, you know, and you're gonna get knocked down. Trust, I've gotten knocked down several times. I've gotten yelled at, I've gotten my sketches thrown at me. Um, I thought I was gonna fail, I've gotten fired. I mean, th you know, it's, this is what happens during a career. Um, but you have to believe in your talent and you know, when you're good and when you're not good. I mean, I think you all like, you know, when you're good at, you know, like I love to sing in the shower. I'm pretty honest that I'm, I'm a horrible singer. You know, it's like, you know, you know, things that you're good at and things that you're not good at when you really step back and you're honest with yourself. So if you're like, no, I can do this. And there's things that I know I can't design. I'm, I'm not a good dress designer mostly because I don't really love wearing dress. You know, it's like, it's hard for me to 
to design certain categories, but certain things I, I know that I'm good at. And, you know, you, you, you sharpen your skills, but yeah, in the beginning, sometimes you gotta, you gotta fake your confidence a little bit, but know that, you know, know and believe in yourself. An interesting question about internships, and I don't know if you can directly answer this, but for people who are beyond college age, um, I see at least two questions in regards to this. Later in their careers, how do they get internships? Is it too late? Is that I mean, it's never too late. You can always do something. But what would you suggest there? I don't think it's too late. I think um, there, like I said, like when I first started in my career, I worked in, in, you know, kind of the urban streetwear market. And then it took a huge nosedive, like 2005, 2006, it took a huge nosedive. I couldn't buy a job interview. I couldn't get interview. I couldn't get an interview at Ralph. I couldn't get an interview at like the gap. Nobody, no other near Calvin, nobody would look at me because they were like, oh, you worked in urban. You know, they thought I was like tainted or something. It was really weird. Nobody talks about it now, but it definitely happened. I moved to Boston you know, like sometimes you gotta, you know, take what you get till you get what you want. You think I wanted to move to Boston. I took a huge pay cut and moved to Boston. Like, ew. <laughs> but, you know, I, I sublet my apartment and I was, you know, my boyfriend was here in New York. I was coming back to New York, taking the bus, like, but that was what I had to do to make a pivot in my career. And then I came back to New York, made more money than I had ever made. And, you know, it was a two year pivot, but you have to, that happens along the career. So no, I don't, I don't think you're ever too old to do something. It's like, sometimes you just have to assess what, if you really want it, you have to take a pay cut and start at the bottom, you know? Absolutely. You got to start from where you're at, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, where would someone start if they wanted to launch their own brand? That's a great question for you. That's, <laughs> I don't know. A loaded question. I don't know. I did it myself and it's extremely hard. Um, you need so much money. Where would you start? I don't know. I really don't know. I, um, I got a small friends and family investment. I have, you know, it, I was 20 years in the industry until before I started, I would probably not recommend waiting that long because then you know better and you should have never started. <laughs> probably better to start when you're young and you don't know any better. Um, you just got to start. It, you just got to start. Um, if you are making the clothes yourself, if you, uh, have a factory relationship, you're making it here in the city, it is going to cost you a ton of money. Um, you have to know some cool people, some famous people or some cool models, get it on people, take photos, put it on Instagram. Um, just try to make yourself stand out. Um, it's, it's, it's very easy, but it's not, I mean, excuse me, it's not very easy. It's very hard, but there's some ways that you can stand out and it's content, 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 you know, get your pieces on everyone that you can photograph them, um, put them on Instagram and it's, or whatever your, your choice of social media is. And it's, it's getting, it's getting your garments seen. That's, that's my biggest advice. I don't know. I'm still trying to do it myself and it's, it's hard. I love it. Thank you for the advice. <laughs> um, a good question that I'm seeing is how do you work under pressure, especially when creating a collection, like during like fashion show season and leading up to that type of thing? Um, be prepared, be prepared for everything. So if you're talking about like doing a fashion show, I mean, do you have to just think of every possible thing that could ever go wrong and be prepared for that? So, and I don't rely on other people to have, to make sure that they're going to be prepared. It's like, okay, I'm going to bring anything that I need to bring. If that's lint rollers, if it's extra copies of my work, it's um, every kind of cord or plug or adapter that I could need. It's um, just any kind of thing you have to really play out the scenarios in your head and see what could go wrong and be overly prepared for it. So that's kind of what I, what I do. And I don't necessarily trust that other people are going to be there and, and get my back. I want to make sure I have everything that I need. Um, just so you, you know, you can, you can be the most prepared and something's always going to go wrong. That's, that's just the, the name of the game. Um, and it's how you manage stress. You can't yell, you can't scream. It's kind of taking things as it comes using your 
cognitive thought and reason, um, reasonable thinking. And it's like, okay, how can I figure out this problem? Okay, we can do this, we can do this, we're taking this, okay. Um, and having good people, you know, don't, don't mishear what I'm saying. Don't, don't, you can't do everything yourself. You absolutely need a team and you need people, but um, just be prepared. And also it, share information, you know, it's like, you're getting to the show venue, you get, whatever it is, it's like, okay, I'm worried about this. I really want to make sure that we have this covered. So talk to people, say what you're, what you're thinking, what you're worrying about. You have to kind of play, play out how you want it to go and see everything that could go wrong. I think that's my best advice. Awesome. Uh, good question here. Who are the first people in the brand to see the mood boards that you create since you showed us your lovely mood boards? Um, the first people in the brand? Yes. Like, who are you showing this to initially? I, I mean, I'm working on it myself with, you know, like my my team would be like whatever the designer, the graphic designer that you're working with. And then you present it to your boss. So in this case, it's it's Glenn, who's the creator of the company. Uh, excuse me, the creative director of the brand. Um, yeah, so the creative director and you, you know, in, in terms of design, usually signs off on it and then you present to to merch or the buying team or, you know, accordingly, but depending on how the company's structured, but but typically design signs off on it first and then you present it to merch. And for athleisure in particular, are there any key words or key items for athleisure that need to be in a move board that you, I mean, since you specialize in the, the area, is there anything in particular that differs from any other design move boards that absolutely needs to be on an athleisure board? Um, I mean, you, you have to think of the product category that you're doing. So, you know, if, if you're doing sport, you want to generally pick garments that, that references that are pertaining to sport. Um, not to say if, you, you know, if you're doing a concept that's, I don't know, Marie Antoinette or whatever ruffles, but whatever, you know, of course you can have references that, but you also have to tailor it for the product category that you're doing. So obviously you want it to look somewhat sporty and somewhat active and, and think of the ultimate pieces that you need again. So like, you know, you're going to need a short, you're going to need a bra, whatever it is. So you want to make sure you have references accordingly. So you want to be able to extrapolate the vision and be able to practically understand the end use categories that you're actually designing in. I mean, it's, it's a tool. It's not just like pie in the sky. Like I'm, I'm not, it's not an art piece. It's, you know, it's a, it's a practical tool. All right, and last question. Um, general advice for aspiring fashion designers and some of your favorite tools that you use. General advice for fashion designers. Um, don't take everything so personal. Um, it's like literally nothing is personal. It's like, unless really you're being mean to your colleagues, like, you know, be, be friendly to your colleagues, you know, but, um, you know, if somebody's giving you it can be harsh, you know, it definitely can be harsh. Critiques can be harsh. It's like, oh, I hate this. People just, you know, they're passionate about something. And it's like, you just know what they're talking about the style. They're not talking about you as a person. Nobody's tearing you down. You have like, on top of the fact you have to have a thick skin, it's it's like, it's really talking about the garments. It's talking about the work. Um, you have to be able to separate the two and then continue to go on with a smile and, you know, be pleasant, be, um, you know, you want to, you want people to enjoy working with you. Um, so I think that's, that's a good people piece of advice. Like you just can't take anything personally. And what was the second part of that question? Oh, some of the tools that I like to yes. use. Tools that you like to use. And I live in illustrator. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm pretty simple with the tools that I use. I mean, I, I, I use electric pens. <laughs> I use these little cheap I use cheap pens. I use I, uh, cheap pencils. I use Sharpies. I use Microns. Um, I, I use really cheap notebooks. I don't use anything fancy. Um, I carry my stuff in like those bags that you get from the hardware store, like those canvas bags. I buy those in bulk when I'm traveling. Um, I don't use, I, I don't think you need like some ultimate notebook or some ultimate that it's, you know, it's, it, you're going to lose stuff constantly when you're traveling and presenting. So I don't think there's any like any any specific tools that you need. Yeah, I think the most important thing that you need to do is your research um, and just be prepared. 
Amazing. So I think we're going to wrap it up here, guys. But Melissa has been wonderful. And oh. I'm going to put up a hold screen. But like I said, you can feel free to send any questions that you have to Melissa on Creatively. You can just search her name. And yeah, any closing words, Melissa? I just want to thank everybody for joining. This was really fun. Um, and I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, I really enjoyed doing it. I really enjoyed talking to everybody. And um, Nino wants to say goodbye, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.